Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, my wonderful people. I am Okocha Pimaso. This, if today is your first time of coming here, kindly subscribe to this channel. Now, Andoy Jimako has come to the Arise News to talk about the issue of um, Namdekano. Before, I told you people that the Department of State Service, DSS, has been acting drama. Everything they have been doing is just drama with the federal government, uh, you know, advice, in like advice to them and so on and so forth. Now, the reason why they have been preventing the council to Namdekano access to him is what Anlo Ujimako has come to Arise News to clarify. When you see the DSS Flesimozi, you will think that those people, they are something else. But when you look at the deep inside of what they are doing, it's just lawless. Indeed, we are living in a lawless country. Take a listen to Anlo Ujimako. Well, he joins us now. Thank you so much, uh, Barrister, for joining us. Help us make sense of this. We understand your client, Namdekano, is accusing DSS uh, first violation of court order and then, of course, access to his lawyer the, based on the fact that he, he might have access to medical care and all of that. The second thing is also to begin trial. But the argument the DSS is putting forward mm -hmm. is that there is no case in this and that because the former judge who was presiding over the matter, uh, Binta Nyako, uh, you know, withdrew from the case. So that's the argument the DSS yes. is putting for you. And they are saying there is no case in this uh, particular development. What's your reaction to this? Well, we, we disagree. Uh, it's the, the, the legal opinion is based on the wrong premise that the recusal of Justice Binta Nyako invalidated all the orders she issued in the case. We disagree with that. As a matter of fact, the um, private counsel to the Office of the Attorney General took prompt steps to file a process in court advancing this argument, seeking a nullification or maybe a blessing of the court to nullify all the orders issued by Justice Pinter. In the case, just by virtue of the recusal, we filed a counter process, you know, arguing in the opposite. And we disagree with this totally because if you indeed all these orders are null and void by virtue of the recusal, it is also the same Justice Binta Inyako who issued the order of remand that led to the detention of Mazin Namekano. So, as a matter of fact, our counter argument can be used as a sword and shield. So, if the court was going to grant their application, to invalidate all these orders, it would naturally lead to the release of Mass in Lamekano because the same order, the same judge issued the order of, of detention. So that order should have been invalidated. So, but our position is that the DSA should not be allowed or the federal government should not be allowed to cherry pick the orders to obey and the ones not to obey. So evidently, they want to comply with the order of detention by continuing to detain Mass in Lamekano but they now want to, don't want to comply anymore with the order on the visitation regimen for councils to Mazin Namdekano. This the, is the cross of the matter. All right. But the counter, you file it counter, uh, I mean... Uh, yeah, process. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. How is a court reacting to that? How is the court responding? What is the process to listen to what you've already filed? Well, uh, because of the significant merit of the counter argument mm. we filed, on the next adjourned date for the hearing of the case at the Court of Appeal, their counsel rose in court and withdrew their application. That tells us that they no longer maintain that position. So now that DSS, subsequent to that, refused us access to Namdekan, we started wondering if it's a case of left hand not knowing what right hand is doing. Because we did advance the information to the DSS and said, listen, the application or the legal position upon which you are placing restrictions on counsel to Mazin Namdekano has changed or has been withdrawn by your counsel. But they continued. So that left us with no option than to pursue some kind of judicial uh, action to get DSS to comply. So I proceeded to court to file what is called a Form 49. A form 49 is a process by which you compel a defaulter, a contemnor, or somebody who is uh, uh, breaching a court order or not obeying or complying. You use that process to, com to compare compliance. Mm. That's what happens, and that's how uh, the, this whole thing came to, 
to this pass. I, I know that the court um, also has gone a, as far as threatening the DSS uh, Director General Diola um, yes. You know, uh, so what impact would that have on this case, and how does that make you feel? Well, I, I do believe that it already has an impact because we I did get some feelers. I'm not. Uh, I'm aware. I'm fully aware of the intervention of uh, on Obi Agocha and the, the Honorable Speaker as well, uh, Tajudi in Abbas. They intervened politically uh, on this matter and tried to resolve it uh, by way of compromise. So I did, uh, I had access to informal information that DSS has, you know, retraced its steps. It's done willing to do the right thing so that I should bring uh, the process a letter uh, submitting names of uh, the councils that were visiting Ram the Ghana on Monday. So I have done that. So on Monday, we are going to go there, and I'm hoping that the restrictions will be lifted. If they are lifted, fine. We go and interface with our client as the court ordered. If they are not lift, listed, I mean lifted, then the, the process in court shall continue to okay. its logical conclusion. Okay, looking ahead now, what's your next step? Should DSS continue to you know, refuse access to his legal team. What, what's the next step? What are you going to do next? If they continue, you know, this particular, uh, you know, practice of refusing Nambikano access to his legal team or maybe medical care, for instance. Well, you know, what is on board now is the access to him. Yeah. You know, uh, he's entitled to have access to his counsel under Section 36 of Nigerian Constitution. That's right. Nobody is supposed to miss with that. And then this one, too, was supported by a court order. You have someone in detention where he's not even supposed to be. He's not supposed to be detained at the DSS in the first place. DSS is a glorified holding cell. He's supposed to be detained in prison where these restrictions normally do not institutionally occur. DSS is a security environment with restrictions built in place that they take for granted. But these restrictions don't go well for detainees. So we don't want to break their back or to compare them to check, you know, change their system overnight uh, just because of our client. But if you insist on detaining him at that place, that location, where he's not supposed to be detained, then you have to make certain adjustments. If you don't, they are going to get in trouble with the court that issued the order. All right. Just before I let you go, Barrister, uh, speak to us. There are narratives out there mm -hmm. that the reason why we're still having um, the issue of insecurity in the southeast is because Namdi Khan is still in detention. Uh, confirm to me, is that true? Would the release of Namdi Khan address the issue of insecurity in the southeast, particularly the we talk about the unknown government and all of that. He is said there any link? Okay. He said it himself in open court. On, you know, recently when he addressed the press after the court session, he said it himself. He has that confidence. He possesses that confidence. And the aura, he has the aura, of, and he has the followership and the clout and the influence to change the tide of things in the southeast. But we don't be misinterpreted as you know, being the foundation for insecurity. Because if he said it himself, that until he's released before it's, uh, security or peace can return to Southeast, isn't that a kind of indictment or his own part? No, it's not. It's not. Um, you see, it's, it, it, nature abhors a vacuum. There was insecurity in the Southeast before this, this time around, this, before his rendition. There was. Maybe you had kidnappings, robberies, what have you. But you see, the rendition of Mazin Namdekano and his continued detention, you know, have, you know, have all together fueled um, a new regime of some people who latched on to that to cause mayhem. So when you refuse, when you re so it, it has become a constant factor for good, bad, and ugly. He meant for good, but people latched on. Bad people are latching on to that. I have seen situations where some government were arrested and they say, well, we are doing it for Mazin Kano. He never sanctioned any such thing. He headed a non-violent, informed, and headed a non-violent organization. And he remained committed to that until when he was uh, renditioned. So people can go there 
out there and try to do unlawful things based on that, either out of mischief or maybe they believe in what they are doing. But when you remove the constant factor, which is his continued detention, tell me whether anybody will have further excuse to, com to, to, to commit any mayhem or, sway or to engage in any act of insecurity. No, it wouldn't be. It doesn't mean that Nnamdi Kano's disciples are the ones responsible for the insecurity. That is far from the truth because he himself has condemned it openly in court and made the distinction between a genuine agitator for referendum for Biafra and someone who is using it as a stepping stone or an excuse to commit criminality. He made that demarcation very clear. All right. I think we just have to leave it there. Hopefully, your prayers to the court will be granted. Thank you so much, Barrister Loy Ejimako, uh, lawyer to Namdekan. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Frank.